Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us at today's quarantine virtual science cafe. Uh, for, are you just joining us? I hope you take the opportunity to introduce yourself in the chat box. Just your first name and where you're joining us from would be great. I do have a poll question launched that is asking how you heard about this webinar today. If you happen to click other, would you just let us know in the chat box too how you heard about us? That'd be fantastic. About everybody who signed up for this webinar has logged in, which is, which is great. You guys are right on top of things every week. I'm really amazed that everybody has logged in by about two or three after three. So we're going to get going. I'm Laura Wilson. I'm a 4-H science professional with the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. I'm so glad that you're here with us. 4-H is a community for all learners with programs that suit a variety of backgrounds and interests, budgets, and schedules. We work in school, after school, we have clubs and camp programs. Our 4-H positive youth development programs are available in your local community. And we welcome everyone who wants to have fun and learn and grow. 4-H is the youth that develop 4-H is the Youth Development Program of the University of Maine. We're brought to you by the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. So as you take a minute to introduce yourself in the chat box, um, here in Maine, we have Dr. Vanessa Klein with us. She will be monitoring the chat box and she'll be defining some science terms. So if something our guest today mentions you don't understand, just you know, shout out in the chat box and Dr. Klein will be happy to help you out. We also have Alice Philbrick monitoring the chat box. Jesse Brainerd is hosting our Q&A, which is where you ask questions of our, our guests today. And we're, they're working behind the scenes to make this all run smoothly. We're gonna keep it really simple. Our guests will share some of her cool research. She'll share a bit about herself. And today she has some really cool photos and videos. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that today. We'd love to see your reactions to what our guest presents. Uh, keep on topic as much as you can in the chat box. Keep the language clean and appropriate so we can all have a little bit of fun. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Danielle Levesque. Dr. Levesque, would you tell our participants about yourself and your work? We're really, really happy to have you here with us today. Thanks, Laura. Sorry, I have a bit of a cold, uh, so apologies for coughing in advance. Um, I actually made an introductory slide, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen if that's all right. Um, and hopefully everyone can see this. Uh, so I'm actually Canadian, so if occasionally I have a weird accent, that's what it is. I'm from Ottawa, Ontario, a eight-hour drive kind of due west of here, uh, although you kind of have to go north to go sideways. Uh, and I traveled around a lot during my career before finally settling down in Maine. I did my PhD in South Africa, which is the little B uh, on the map there, um, with fieldwork in Madagascar that I'm going to talk a little bit about today. And then I spent two years in Malaysian Borneo, which is the D on the map there. Uh, my grandfather looked at the world and figured out that it was uh, physically the furthest away I could possibly be from home. Uh, and then um, I finally settled down the closest to home I'd been in a very, very long time here in Maine. And I realized the way my screen is shared, I cannot see the chat. So if there's any questions, um, if one of you want to put your video on and flag me down, I think that's probably the easiest way to do that. We will um, take care of that for you. That's why we great. have all of us here to help okay. you out. <clears throat> Perfect. Zoom keeps changing its settings on me. <laughs> so, um, as my mom jokes over the years that I've given her a bit of a geography lesson as well as the biology lesson based on the various things I've been working on throughout the time. So you might get a bit of a geography lesson as well today. Um, but I guess I'll spend a couple minutes talking about what my research actually is at the University of Maine um, before I get into some of the more kind of fun stuff about fieldwork, something I wish I was um, doing a bit more these days instead of the office work I end up doing. Um, so I study physiology of animals. Basically, I look at, I usually I do this by putting them in boxes and measuring the metabolic rate, which you can see with the little red squirrel here. Um, and then I also look at how they operate in the field. So this is a body temperature trace from a flying squirrel here in Maine. And the black line is their body temperature. And you can see it goes up when they're active at night, which is the gray bars, and then down when they're resting during the day. 
And so I use this information to get an idea by looking at them in the field on how they use energy in the field and why, um, and, and kind of what it costs them to, to do what they do for a living. Uh, and then I also look at this from an evolutionary perspective. So I look at how the ancestral mammal was, we're not sure about certain characteristics, but it radiated into this crazy diversity of mammals we see today. Um, and so some of what I do is looking at what mammals do today to try to get an idea of what they might have done in the past. And then understanding how animals and environment interact gives us an idea on how to potentially predict the impacts of climate change, which is what a lot of my work um, is doing here in the Mammals of Maine that I'll talk to you um, at the end of things. Um, and I realize I also can't see the time, so I'll try to make sure I don't go over time. Uh, so I started in the field work in a very kind of unadventurous way. This is from a field course during my undergrad, which was at uh, McGill University in Montreal, uh, basically counting trees in the forest. And so um, one thing that's always surprising when you take something like wildlife biology in college is to find out that you need to learn a lot about habitat because anytime you're talking about an animal, you need to know where it lives. And so my very first field experience was as part of a field course um, at university. And then later that summer, I got lucky enough to spend most of my days in a trailer with really fancy equipment measuring metabolic rates of squirrels, but I occasionally got to see them out in the forest. Uh, and what you see here is a red squirrel that is eating a snowshoe hare. And so red squirrels, you might think they're cute, but pound for pound, they're probably the most angry thing on the planet because they're hyper-territorial. Uh, and in the Yukon, when there's a snowshoe hare, um, so they cycle, but when there's a snowshoe hare high and the populations are everywhere, um, basically everything eats them. Uh, and so fieldwork life can be glamorous. I was lucky enough to be sleeping in a trailer with a mattress, but most of my colleagues were sleeping in these plywood shacks. Uh, and this was a, a joke we'd played on someone when he left for a holiday and was coming back with his girlfriend. Uh, we painted his hut pink for him. Um, and anyway, so we have a bit of fun. So some of the common techniques we use in the field are, uh, if you're lucky enough to be able to find an animal in their nest, you can go and take them down. Uh, and take a look at them. And so this is um, with the Red Squirrel Project, they do these surveys where they go into the nest at one week and then go back at three weeks and weigh the young, take a clip to get their DNA to find out who um, the father is and kind of health checks and stuff. And so um, at this stage, this is they're 28 days old and they're already starting to crawl around. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll trap them and so uh, if you're trapping for things in Maine, like chipmunks and mice and stuff, you use these kind of metal traps here that we bait with peanut butter and oat balls. Uh, and then the bottom right corner is um, in Malaysian Borneo, this is a tree shrew, which are weird things that are actually more closely related to primates, but look a lot like squirrels. Uh, and we catch them with bananas that usually we put a tiny drop of ethanol in that helps release the smell um, and attract the animals. And then we stick them in a bag and we measure them. Usually you take weight, we try to figure out the sex, uh, we look for parasites and um, just generally try to get an idea of the health of the individual before releasing them. If you want to find out a bit more about the animal, one other thing that's really commonly done is radio tracking. So you'll see in the bottom right, there's a guy there with a big kind of thing under his neck, that's a radio collar and it allows us to find them um, and follow them kind of around their habitat. And I'll talk a bit more about meerkats in a little bit, but there's a lot of meerkats here, including the one behind me, um, because I spent some time in the Kalahari. If you're lucky enough to be able to have a population of animals that you can get habituated to people, so you get used to their presence without disturbing their behavior too much, you can do things like have them trained to, be, to walk on scales. So at the Meerkat Project, it's been done for about 25 years now, uh, where you have these whole families of meerkats that kind of grow up and, and when they're little, you kind of get them hooked on hard boiled eggs and water and convince them to jump on the scale. And sometimes they don't and you have to pick them up, but most of the time they cooperate. And what you'll notice is that massive kind of square mark on the meerkat is actually a dye mark. So we just use regular kind of hair dye and a paintbrush and would paint different patterns on the animal. So you would know which individual was what based on the kind of um, the markings. Uh, and yeah, it was pretty fun. Uh, but most of the time was spent just sort of following them from a distance and trying to figure out what they were doing. Uh, and then occasionally, if you stopped and took a break, they would use you as a lookout post. Um, 
and the bottom right was the PhD student I was working for, Raf Maras, uh, was hanging out with one of the roving males uh, and um, posed for a picture, which is kind of fun. <clears throat> so, sorry. <coughs> um, after my master's that I did on chipmunks, and I'm going to skip that part completely because meerkats are more exciting, um, I was lucky enough to spend six months working at this meerkat project, which is in South Africa, but at the very northern part. So we're zoomed in here on the continent of Africa, uh, and the meerkat project is in the Kalahari Desert, which kind of spans that intersection between South Africa, Botswana, and Namibia. And it's just a really ridiculously gorgeous part of the world. Deserts are fantastic. Um, although there's way more things that can kill you like snakes and scorpions than there are in Maine. So there are good things about Maine, um, but there's no black flies or mosquitoes in the desert. So it's also nice. Um, it's located near the town of Venzalus, which is just down the street from a town called Hot as Hell. Uh, because it gets to about 55 degrees Celsius, which I think is like 120 Fahrenheit. Uh, in the summer, so it, it's a pretty appropriate name for the area. Um, and uh, meerkats are kind of fun because they live in these cooperative groups and are what, what are called cooperative breeders, which means that the, um, the young will stick around with their parents and help out. And so I have a question for everybody here, and that's uh, why do you think meerkats live in groups? So what I'll do is I'll let you know when we have 85, 90% of the poll results in, because I can track how many people have responded, and then we can share the results. Great. Yeah, it's really weird that it's not letting me see the chat anymore. So we have over 90% of our participants have jumped in and, and uh, have voted on this one. So I'm going to end the poll in about five seconds and share the results. Yeah, you guys are right. <laughs> so uh, the, the number one answer was all of the above. And the second one was also the one that is the pretty, the sort of strongest of the two, and that's the need to help rising young. So the Kalahari, despite what this picture, or both pictures look like, I happen to be there during a particularly rainy summer, um, is a really harsh environment. And these are insect eating animals. And so if there's no rain, there's not a lot of insects and life can be really hard. So what will happen is that the, um, the siblings will, or the kind of meerkat kids will hang out with their family and the daughters will actually help um, they'll also produce milk to help raise the young and they do things like babysit. So you'll have when the when the pups are really, really young, it's they're too young to go out foraging with the group. So the groups will kind of stay in a central area and then go eat throughout the day and then come back. Um, and what they'll do is they'll leave the pups with uh, babysitters who will kind of hang out and not eat that day so they can kind of protect their young and assuming maybe that there's some kind of teaching going on too because meerkats are surprisingly smart. Um, and so would, when they're still little, eventually you'll get to see them kind of come out of the burrow and start wandering around. Um, and some days they'll just do this. This was, ha was taken on a, a particularly cold morning. So it was um, just above zero uh, Celsius, sorry, just above freezing, I guess. Uh, and they were, the fa whole family was out sunning themselves and the pups were kind of frolicking around. And then eventually the group left the pups with the babysitter. Uh, and so I'm just going to show, I'm going to take my headphones out for a second. So here's um, a really quick um, clip and hopefully the volume works. But what I want you to listen to is when the meerkats stop making noise. So basically what the pups do is they're continuously kind of calling to their family like a, usually it's a feed me, feed me, feed me, but also like a, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And so um, here it is. Apologies for the poor um, camera work. It was just taken on a digital camera. Mom, I'm trying to leave the day. Oops, mom. So 
so um, I should say that was about five o'clock in the morning. What happened was we would wake up with the meerkats, follow them around for about three hours, and then we could go have a break, eat food and stuff, and then join them again about um, three hours before sunset, follow them, and then get weights before they went down. So you end up with a sort of wait when they get up in the morning, wait after eating for a few hours, and then the same thing at night. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, you're looking for all kinds of behaviors. So who's feeding who? Um, what are they looking at? What kind of noises are they making? And because this project has been going on for almost 30 years now, there's been an insane amount of research and kind of understanding how animal groups work, also how learning works. So I don't have a video of this, but they'll actually, um, when they have the pups, they'll bring them scorpions that they've killed completely and taken the stinger off uh, when they're really little. And then when they get bigger, they'll just give them the scorpion that's live without the stinger and then finally when they know that they can take it they'll give them the scorpion without with the stinger and they can um they can do it so it's really great uh so this is babysitters um just generally being cute and the really handy thing if you're going to be walking around a desert and um, where there's scary things like snakes is that meerkats are always going to find them before you and they'll do this kind of mobbing behavior uh that'll keep the snake at bay, so they try to look big and, and scary, and then the snake eventually kind of wanders off and gives up. And so one of the, the answers um, was to the question was uh, to help look for predators as part of their group thing. So not only do they kind of help each other by finding food, uh, but they're always on the lookout. So what'll happen is when one, when the group of meerkats is looking around, there'll always be one kind of sitting up at a tree, looking around and trying to find help. And so what has just happened here is that they've seen a bird or something scary in the distance and one of them made an alarm call. They all ran down a hole and now they're up from the hole trying to look around. Um, and this was uh, just a really cute baby. So I thought I'd zoom in on it. Um, and so what happens at the stage of their lives is that the, the um, adults are feeding the, the pups and the pups are kind of wandering around and digging in holes that adults have already dug in to try to figure out um, what they're digging for and how to find it. Um, at the same time, they're, they're kind of making this continuous begging call. So, no, being very successful at digging. And then when they do get food, their calls change slightly. <laughs> but it's a good thing you, they're cute because if you can imagine following um, kind of <laughs> whiny baby meerkats for three hours could could get a bit um, tiresome if they weren't so ridiculously cute. And um, so one of the things I was actually doing while I was there was we were putting poo on trays and I don't have a video unfortunately and getting the meerkats to sniff it to see um, if they responded differently to poo that was from their group versus ones that weren't and it turns out that they did and so if anybody's interested I can share this with them but uh, that was basically what I was doing for six months was following around the subordinate males as they go look for females. Um, and it was just kind of a really, really fun time. Um, but what I really do and what I'm interested in, and this is where we're going to get away from the field side of things and into the more science side of things, is I study hibernation in mammals and who hibernates and who does and, and what it is. So I should start by giving a definition of hibernation. Um, and so you might have heard of things like groundhogs that hibernate. And um, I'm going to show a bunch of graphs that look like this. But basically, um, there's always going to be body temperature uh, and then over time. And it's always going to be in Celsius because uh, that's what science is in. So just to situate yourself, uh, 38 is around 98 degrees like we are. And then zero is uh, 30 Fahrenheit. Um, so what we have here is a fall active ground squirrel. And you can see the body temperature is kind of high, around 37 like us. Uh, and then they do these kind of test drops and they go into what's called torpor, which is where their body temperature and their metabolic rates drop. Um, and they're basically in this weird state that's not quite sleep because their brain patterns are actually like what you'd get in a coma. 
uh, but it's, it's kind of broken up by these periods of time where they have to warm up to normal temperatures before going back down. Um, and we're not 100% sure why they do this. We think it's just that there's stuff that gets shut off during hibernation that they need to turn back on for periods of time. But if you're curious what it looks like, this is an infrared recording of a chipmunk warming up from hibernation um, that I took in my lab during my master's. Um, and so you can see at the moment it's uh, at around 10 degrees Celsius, which is 50 maybe. Um, and it's slowly warming up. So it starts with the heart and the brain and the and uh, the kind of forelimbs. And a lot of the heat is being produced by this patch of fat on their back. And then eventually it got up and escaped. <laughs> and so it's this crazy process that actually um, is equivalent to sort of running yourself to exhaustion. So it takes a lot of energy. And there's some really extreme kind of forms of hibernation that happens. So the kind of champion of hibernation is the Arctic ground squirrel or the, I think they're called the tick tick because that's the sound they make too. Um, and these guys were recorded to go down in terms of body temperature as low as negative three degrees Celsius, which is like 20 something Fahrenheit. Um, so they actually super cool, which is really neat. So it happens in a lot of um, cold blooded species, but not in mammals. Um, some of it, they have a lot of sugar in their blood, but there's lots of neat stuff there. Uh, so I do have a quick poll for you all here. And this is other than groundhogs, who do you think hibernates? Realize that I might have um, <clears throat> forgotten an answer on this question. So we are about, oh, 100% of people have voted. I'm going to stop the poll and share the results. That was quick. This was 100% a trick, trick question. They all hibernate. <laughs> so, um, so everybody got it right. Uh, so um, actually, I also forgot to kind of share the gift properly. But this is a, a type of ground squirrel, the 13 line ground squirrel. Um, and you can see it's kind of scary the first time you have an animal that hibernates on you because uh, you think they're dead, but they're not. And eventually if you start pulling them enough like this, they'll wake up. And there's actually a really old paper that you could never do this these days, but they, um, they threw them back and forth across a room to find out how, um, how much kind of stimulus they could take before they woke up. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it's one of my favorite papers ever. So um, I'm gonna show you the mammal family tree here. And so what you're looking at is the different groups of mammals. So monotremes are things like echidnas, uh, which are spiny hedgehog things that lay eggs, and platypus, which are most people are more familiar with, uh, and then marsupials, uh, and then we're primates and rodents. And so the rest are all just names of, of mammal orders. Um, so these, my mouse isn't showing up, unfortunately, but the kind of red chunk in the middle, the artiodactyla and the cetacea, those are things like um, deer and whales. Um, and so on. And so what I want you to pay attention to here is that if the line is blue, it means that there's an animal in that order of mammals that can hibernate. And so the way we usually try to figure things out in evolutionary biology is that if a lot of the groups, the modern groups are a particular thing, so in this case blue, it probably means that the ancestor was blue. So we think now that um, the ancestral mammal was capable of hibernation and that's one of the reasons they managed to survive um, all of the bad conditions that happened when the asteroid hit 65 million years ago and all the dinosaurs went extinct. So it means that there is a possibility that we in our genetic programming still have all of the kind of codes to be able to hibernate. We just don't know how to make it happen or we've lost the ability to do it because our brains take up too much energy and we can't turn them off. Um, so the ones that we're kind of used to here are in the rodents. To give you an idea of why the monotreme line is blue, echidnas are actually really good hibernators. Um, so this might look a little crazy, but what we're looking at here is in a warm spot in Australia. So Queensland is in the north part of Australia. And if you go north in Australia, you're going closer to the equator. Um, and so you get these kind of inconsistent patterns. I should also say that the reason the lines are so squiggly when they're not hibernating is echidnas are really weird. Um, and they have super low, but also really variable body temperatures. So um, 
the only time they keep a constant body temperature, and you can see it in sort of the top left and then where those arrows are in the right, is when the female is incubating her egg. So they'll lay an egg into their pouch um, and then carry the egg around with them for a couple weeks. And in that case, they keep a really um, tight body temperature. So we think that one of the reasons why we have a high and constant body temperature is because it helps us raise our young. Um, so surprisingly, uh, those you, the, the person who picked mouse lemurs, you were correct. Uh, so primates can hibernate. Right here we have a picture of a loris and a dwarf lemur, and the slow loris is capable of these kind of weekly hibernation things when it gets cold, uh, and same thing with dwarf lemurs. And so uh, they do it a bit differently. And so the, the ground squirrel pattern where they went really, really low and stayed down for weeks and then went up is a bit different in things like dwarf lemurs. So here's two different traces from a dwarf lemur in Madagascar. And in the top one, they were in a tree that was pretty loosely insulated. So um, the, the dotted lines and the dashed lines are the tree hole temperatures. And then the blue, black line is the animal's body temperature. And they warm up every day because that's what the sun is doing. So even in the middle of winter in Madagascar, it still gets above kind of 30 degrees during the day, which is pretty nuts. Um, and, and so they don't have to do that crazy kind of rewarming thing um, when they're in these poorly insulated trees. When they're in the big kind of giant baobabs that stay at a bit more constant temperature, you do get these occasional times that they rewarm. So one of the things that we're interested in when we study hibernation in mammals is why some species have to rewarm and why others don't. Is there some kind of magic temperature? So here you can see at the bottom line that it stays kind of below 25 degrees and then has to warm up. And so is that the kind of magic temperature? Because if, say, you want to try to get humans to hibernate, it's fine to go down, but it's the coming up part that really does a lot of damage to your body. And so if we can avoid the number of times we have to do that, then it's a kind of better way to help hibernate to get people to Mars. So that's, uh, that's one of the reasons we study different species, as well as just knowing about that animal and, and understanding how they work in their environment. Um, and the question that always comes up is, well, what kind of carnivores hibernate? Uh, so skunks can do it for short periods of time, and then bears. And so I have a question for you all, um, and I'm always curious about what people think about this. Uh, do bears hibernate? get my screen ready for the next one. <coughs> just about, oh, just about everybody has voted. So I'm going to shut down the poll in just a few seconds here. There we go. Okay, so sometimes people say that bears don't hibernate because they don't drop their body temperature down to zero degrees Celsius. Um, but by a classical definition, they spend six months in a hole, not moving, and their metabolic rate actually drops significantly. And so what I have here is one of my favorite videos ever. It's from my colleagues at the University of Fairbanks, Alaska. So they end up getting um, problem bears that end up hanging out in trash cans in um, Alaska that would be euthanized otherwise, and they end up um, putting a bunch of instrumentation. So they, they put something to measure their heart rate, they put something to measure their brain waves, um, and they stick them in these kind of cabins where they allow them to hibernate over the winter so they can measure things like metabolic rate. Uh, and this is what a hibernating bear sounds like. Sorry, I'm stuck in the wrong way.
So if you ever have a chance to look at a bear and it's wandering around, take fast its breathing and then compare it to that. Because one of the things that happens in hibernation is breathing rate is slowed down significantly. Um, and I mean, also they snore, so it's pretty fun. Uh, and bears are really neat because they they manage to spend six months kind of curled up in a ball this way and end up not having any muscle damage. So if we were to spend, you know, three months on bed rest, you get a lot of uh, muscle kind of disintegrating and you need to build them up again. But bears have a whole bunch of crazy adaptations that allow them to um, be functional. And so they're studied a lot in a kind of biomedical uh, way to be able to figure out how they manage to to do all of this. And again, I think if you're going to send people to space, you want them to hibernate like a bear, not like a ground squirrel. Um, <clears throat> which brings me to Tenrex. And so um, I guess I could have put a poll with how many of you have heard of a Tenrex before, because uh, the answer is usually not a lot. And it makes me want to spend a bit of time on this weird group of mammals called the Afrotheria. So for a long time, all of the animals in this group were kind of put in with other species that they look alike. But when we started to look at the genetics and kind of really get an idea of the mammal family tree, this weird group of animals came out that are now only found in Africa. Uh, it includes things like elephants, the aardvark, um, these weird things called hyraxes that are about this big and they live, um, they're kind of like the squirrels of Africa. Um, elephant shrews, if you've ever seen them, they have the crazy little noses, uh, tenrex and then manatees and they're all in this really closely related group. So if you've noticed now that I mentioned hedgehogs and they hibernate and echidnas and they all have spines and so do tenrex and so it's this crazy thing that we call convergent evolution where just this kind of idea of being a small spiky thing that eats insects and lives at night um, is a really useful successful way to be a mammal so it's evolved multiple times and so anyway it's kind of fun so i spent five years during my phd living in a tent and you can see it was a pretty nice tent if you're ever going to set up a base camp i strongly recommend having south africans do it because they know how to camp in style <laughs> so i had a platform i had a roof over my head and i had these tents and what you can see is the constant kind of clothes hanging out because it was the rainy season um, this was a dry forest um, which means it's dry during the winter but then we had 1.5 meters of rain um, in the other six months of the year. So January that I was there, we had 23 days of rain, um, which was pretty fun. Luckily there were no leeches, uh, but it was still rain all the time. Um, and the crazy thing about Tenrex, and it's really hard if you ever try to catch an animal that mostly eats insects and that mostly operates on sound, um, they're really hard to trap. And so we'd originally tried to use these cages that we baited with things like cat food and anchovies, didn't catch anything. Um, we dug a hole and put buckets in to try to use these pitfall traps, but what would happen is we'd get the occasional kind of young that was separated from their mum, but we weren't capable of getting the mums because they were too big for the buckets. Uh, so what we ended up having to do is walk the trails of the forest at night um, with our Malagasy guides and these funky V-shaped sticks that they basically managed to kind of put behind the neck of the animal and then pick them up and put them in a bag and we'd take them back to camp. Um, so what's nice about islands is that these animals evolved without predators, so they're pretty tame. Um, you still have to chase them down, but not anywhere near as, they're not as fast as things like squirrels. And even we were working on a species of mouse while we were there and you could literally just kind of pick them out of a tree, which was kind of fun. You still have to move quickly, but it would be completely impossible to catch a squirrel with your bare hands here or incredibly difficult. And what we did is we put these radio collars and then something to measure their body temperature. And it turns out we were trying to put a radio collar on their neck, but Tenrex don't have a neck. And so we tried a backpack and that didn't work. And so eventually we ended up having to do surgery and kind of stick it into their abdominal cavity. Uh, and this is our surgery site. I don't know if you can see it, but in the far background, there's like a fluffy thing with long tails. Um, those were the, the lemurs. Um, Oh, the why we're wearing two different types of gloves is, uh, yeah, just people had different choices. Um, they, they've, they bit really hard and we couldn't find ones that worked for all of them. Um, so here's our surgery and um, the lemurs hanging out in the background are the, the sifakas, which is the same kind as uh, zububafu, if anyone's curious. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Unfortunately for us, a lot of our animals ended up in snakes, and so I have some of the best body temperatures and um, location data for Malagasy boas of anyone on the planet just by accident. And so these lovely lumps here are um, my animals in a snake. Um, at least 20 of them were eaten by snakes, and um, a couple of them were killed by civets, and then one was hit by a car, which was kind of sad. 
Uh, and then eventually, if we were lucky, the snake would regurgitate our transmitter package as, as well as all the other parts that they couldn't eat. And so what we ended up getting was some really cool data that looked exactly like what the hibernation in the lemurs looked like. So here, um, again, the tree temperature is in gray and then the animal's body temperature is in black. And so you could see that for the period of time that they're hibernating during the winter in there, which is our summer, um, their body temperature kind of followed the tree hole temperature. And then when they wake up, they kind of get a bit more normal. Um, for a tenric anyway. And so my guys would live anywhere from in a hole in the tree to kind of three meters up a tree to in really obvious places. Like you can see, this is where the guy was sleeping during the day. Um, so I spent most of my days kind of following them around, finding where they lived. Uh, for the females, I could find when, um, when they uh, gave birth because they would stay in a tree for multiple days. Um, and I spent about three years of my life doing that. So this was the hedgehog ones. And then the big guys that we were looking at that I showed a picture earlier actually did something really crazy. So they would go, they would be active in September when it started to rain. They would run around, they would mate, and the males would just get fatter and fatter and fatter. And then come January, they would all go under and start hibernating. And so it might be a little tricky to see, this is a weird graph, but the, the gray bars are the ambient temperatures. And then the red line is the soil temperature and the blue line is the animal's body temperature. So what you can see is when it's active, it's still pretty low for an animal. So they have a body temperature in the 90s Fahrenheit. Um, and then it dropped down to what the soil temperature was for about eight months. We ended up having to dig these guys up because our radio collars were dying. But what we ended up finding was that they spent the entire nine month period just down at 25 degrees and didn't warm up once. So we've managed to actually convince some colleagues now, one of my colleagues at the University of Las Vegas has a, col has a colony of these now um, where he's trying to look at how they managed to do this, how they managed to kind of survive without that um, periodic rewarming to normal body temperatures, um, and then how we could get humans to do that. So there's been a lot of investment from various biomedical agencies and things like the Defense um, Research Fund to try to get humans to hibernate. Uh, because that's one of the kind of goals um, of, of things like the Mars mission and everything. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of it for hibernation right now. And I wanted to end pretty quickly on, on some of what I'm doing here in Maine. And so um, we, do have, we do have a quick question for you, Danielle, in the Q&A. And if anybody else has questions, enter them in there. What is your favorite animal? I saw that. That is such a hard answer. <laughs> I'm gonna have to say Tenrex because they're just really, really cool, um, and and they're they're pretty sweet things. But I don't. I'm, usually, it's whatever I'm working on at the time. So, uh, treasures are pretty cool, and I didn't get a chance to talk about them, but I can answer questions if people are interested. And um, these weird things called moon rats that look like giant stinky rats, but they're they're actually closer related to hedgehogs, and they smell like. Um, someone described them in an old book as rancid Irish stew. So I don't, I don't, anything. Um, mostly small weird ones. <laughs> and so, <coughs> sorry, not just working on hibernation anymore, I'm also trying to work on how animals respond to heat to try to get at some climate change predictions. And so one of the animals that I've been interested in working on um, in Maine are flying squirrels. So uh, most people, unless you've seen one, I always get a question of, we have flying squirrels here in Maine because they're super secretive and hard to find unless you get lucky. Um, and see them in your backyard or you get unlucky and find them in your attic. Um, we actually have two species, a northern flying squirrel, which is a bit bigger and a bit fluffier, and then the southern flying squirrel. Uh, and the southerns have been moving north recently. And so a lot of what I'm doing in my lab at the moment is trying to find out where they are in Maine. And um, is it just that it's not cold enough to keep the southerns out anymore or is it too hot for the northerns? And so um, just to show you some pictures, we finally found northern flying squirrels uh, in Presque Isle. Um, and so we trap, when we trap in the cold, we have to wrap our cages up in uh, basically space blankets and plastic bags because it was pretty cold. Uh, we end up putting these microchips in them, similar to what you do if you have a pet microchip. Uh, and this is my students taking measurements. And then we stick them in boxes and measure their metabolic rate. We also put these tiny data loggers in them so we can get their body temperature. Uh, I just want to draw your attention to the ridiculously cute fluffy um, feet here. They have little snowshoe feet. And in the summer, the bottoms of their feet are naked so they can use it to um, kind of sweat and lose heat and cool down. And then in the winter, they grow a layer of fur that they can use as little snow boots. So it's, they're pretty cute. 
Um, and uh, this is a PhD student who is visiting from the University of Saskatchewan in Canada who had worked with bats. And when you release a bat, you can kind of lift it up in the air and it will fly off. And he was hoping that it would happen for the flying squirrel. Um, <laughs> and it didn't. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so um, I think I might skip the next slide and uh, end with some of what I'm going to be doing this summer. I recently just got money from the Maine Outdoor Heritage Fund, which is um, funded by lottery tickets, if you ever see them in the store, uh, to look at <coughs> where they happen to be in Maine because we're not sure where the Southerns have moved up and where the Northerns have moved out of yet. So that's what I'm hopefully going to spend some of my time on this summer. Um, and so, yeah, the chipmunk study was focused um, a little bit on hibernation, but also how they respond to low oxygen. Um, so it, uh, I looked at, um, I kind of did the same sticking them in a box and measuring their metabolism, uh, but then I cut the oxygen levels in half to see if they were better in low oxygen conditions when they were hibernating than when they weren't. And it turns out they, they were better. Um, so there's also something to do with hibernation and what the animals do in hibernation that helps them um, deal with with low oxygen conditions so that was kind of a cool um, but really sort of physiology mechanistic study which is why i didn't really talk about them today but chipmunks are great they store food and they're really kind of bizarre hibernators that way and they can they can store like two years of food in their burrows um, and, and part of it will, will be able to, um, it helps them uh, be a bit more flexible when it comes to different um, temperatures and stuff. Uh, and we to, have yeah. another question, Danielle, um, in the Q&A. Do you think that humans will be able to hibernate? That's a tricky question. So the answer is maybe. Um, I think it might take a while because part of the problem is we're really good at cooling things, but we're not good at warming up again. Um, and the kind of damage that can happen, especially to your brain if there's low oxygen. So the thing I, I glossed over is that that tenric that spends, you know, nine months of the year at 25 degrees, they have smooth brains and they're not particularly smart. And so um, part of the thing I worry about when it comes to people in hibernation is kind of preserving brain function. Um, and there's been really cool studies on marmots looking at their kind of ability to remember where food is before and after hibernation. And it does kind of scramble their brains a little bit. Um, so maybe eventually, and we're getting better at understanding what triggers it, but in terms of kind of also maintaining health, uh, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, so I see a few more questions. So uh, are there many breeds? I, I, yeah, I can. Do you want to read them or I can read them to you? Oh, either way works. Yeah. Take over. That's fine. Okay. So are there many breeds of Tenrex? There are, and I wish I had a slide for it, but uh, so there's, it's kind of crazy. So um, Madagascar is an island. Tenrix got to Madagascar, we think, somewhere between 55 and 45 million years ago. The ancestral Tenrix, um, its closest relative on the African mainland is like a weird kind of otter type thing. And then when they got to Madagascar, there's now about 30 somewhat species that look exactly like shrews, but they're Tenrix. And then a group of five of them that look like hedgehogs. And so there's two that look exactly like hedgehogs, like the one I was working on. Uh, there's the common tenrec, which is the um, this guy here that look a bit more um, like a solenodont, if anyone's ever heard of those. Uh, and then there's this cool guy, um, Hemicentides, the this, streaked this tenrec. There's two species of them, uh, and they, uh, they're pretty cool. Um, so it's this really weird example of, of what we call adaptive radiation um, and just how, how things end up looking kind of completely different over time, which is really great, uh, especially when they move into a new environment where there isn't a lot of other animals. Uh, for how big can a chipmunk burrow get? I actually don't know. Pretty big. And they'll have multiple chambers. So if they have different types of food, they'll have like a maple seed chamber and an acorn chamber and then a like a bathroom chamber. And they'll actually go through the little burrows and kind of check all the food all the time. And um, they'll also store things like slugs. So whenever you catch a chipmunk in the traps, you end up catching their, they end up kind of releasing all the contents of their cheap pouch. And we would find a lot of uh, slugs that they've just kind of taken the guts out and we're taking the casings home with them um, and, and all sorts of things like that. So it's, it's a bit weird. Um, and the burrows tend to be out. Oh, there's another question down below that how long does it take for them to dig it? That's a good question. And so sometimes they use burrows that other things have dug. Um, but I don't think anybody really knows 
uh, and some of it's because it's kind of hard to see what happens when they go underground. And so if you want to find out what a chipmunk burrow looks like, the only way to do it is you end up kind of putting spray foam in and then digging up around it. So you destroy that burrow. Um, but they actually change burrows a lot more than we thought originally. So they'll kind of spend the whole summer um, digging burrows and kind of making their thing. And then um, others will steal it. They'll raid each other's stores. Um, and so it kind of, it's a bit more flexible that way. Uh, but yeah, the, we don't, we don't really know. Uh, for meerkat burrows, they're actually dug by um, ground squirrels. So there's the Cape ground squirrel um, and they kind of dig it in families and then meerkats end up using it. And uh, uh, it's the same thing. We're not entirely sure how big they are because it, it's going to be really hard to go in the burrow and find out. Um, the BBC is actually filming. So one of my previous students at UMaine is now at the meerkat project and she's the liaison for the BBC for the latest season of Meerkat Manor that they're making. Um, and I think they now have better cameras that can go underground and so we might actually be able to answer those questions a bit more than we can now. But unless you go with like one of those weird kind of x-ray scanners and try to figure it out, um, it's hard. The problem is a lot of times the field studies that we do are on really shoestring budgets and we have limited um, limited kind of amounts of information or uh, limited money for equipment so we can't answer everything we want to because either we can't see the animals when they're going places or um, it's just kind of hard to to um, get at where they live without destroying it completely so <coughs> excuse me the why would people hibernate well the uh, the big thing is I, I guess to try to get people to mars the idea is um also hibernation is supposed to extend life so if you look at how long animals live usually it's related to lifespan so small animals will live for very short periods of time and then large animals will live for long periods of time and species that hibernate live for longer than they should based on their body mass so there might be something to do with kind of hibernation and the secrets to aging but we're not 100 percent sure um, and then the, yeah, the idea is maybe to kind of get us to Mars. That and I don't know, I think people would just, it would be nice to be able to shut down completely during periods of time a year you don't like or anything. Um, and there's, there's also some nice, um, neat biomedical aspects to it. So one of the things that happen when you hibernate is that blood flow is stopped completely. Uh, and then during those rewarming phases, you actually get the spike of blood. Um, and what it mimics is um, actually what happens during stroke. So uh, a group up in um, also at the University of Fairbanks has been studying this for years to try to find out how to protect the brain from these massive kind of lack of oxygen and then reoxygen periods. Uh, and they've actually gotten to the stage of actually testing some of the compounds that they've found in hibernation in hibernators to do things like help with stroke, um, help with blood loss, uh, and, and all sorts of things. So even if we can never actually get humans to hibernate, we're learning a lot of really interesting, uh, useful kind of biomedical things by looking at these weird animals doing weird things. And so I kind of like to think that if my colleague in Las Vegas ever comes up with this, you know, biomedical breakthrough, it, it's exactly the result of me having spent two and a half years living in a tent in Madagascar and that, that makes me feel pretty happy. Um, yeah, so the question also is about what the average number of groups in meerkat groups um, that I've seen. It really varies. So in the year that I was there, and I can show you the, actually, let me just do this and I'll find it. Um, this particular family here, Kung Fu, um, had, uh, it was pretty rare because the conditions were so good. The dominant male and dominant female had broken off from a different group uh, and managed to have a litter by themselves. And so they were a family of four. And then they, her second litter was seven, which are the kind of two runty ones here. Um, and so if conditions are good, they can survive in smaller groups and tend to get one or two kind of generations. I went back, this was 2008 when I was there, and I went back to visit in 2012, and they were in year four of a pretty solid drought. And this group was up to 30 individuals. And so I had it easy in the morning trying to weigh 10 individuals uh, before they got, because there's like a, a period of time when they're just kind of hanging out around the burrow and you can measure them easily before they kind of get running and, and start eating for the day. Um, so when I went back to visit in 2012, I'm like, wow, I'm glad I'm not working here right now because trying to weigh 35 meerkats in like 
15 minutes is nearly impossible. So it really varies. Um, and a lot of it's based on, on how good the, the conditions are. And I think it finally broke, but the Kalahari had a pretty serious drought um, that, that, uh, that did some serious damage to the populations there. Aardvarks in particular aren't doing well in this part of the world, which is kind of sad because they're really cool. Um, so when did I decide what my profession would be? I kind of always wanted to work with animals. And so uh, I went into college uh, thinking I wanted to go to vet school because I thought that that was the only way you could do that. And the way vet school works in Canada is you do two years of undergrad and then you transfer into vet school. Um, but getting into vet school in Ontario where I'm from is harder than med school because there's a hundred slots for more people that want that. And so I kind of figured if I wanted to continue on in my program, what would be interesting to me uh, so I thought wildlife biology sounded kind of cool. And then uh, as soon as I got there, I was hearing about all the researches my professors were doing and um, realized that there's so many more ways that you can work with animals that don't involve um, being a vet and spending all the, I guess I ended up spending more time in school, but going through all the process of applying to veterinary college. Um, and, and I just kind of got hooked and then, um, I did an exchange uh, to a university in Australia during my undergrad where I got to work with echidnas and um, I just kind of fell in love with looking at this research in terms of hibernation and, and everything and um, I've been lucky enough to keep getting jobs. It, it can be, especially these days, there's more kind of PhDs than there are jobs at universities and so it can be pretty challenging and unfortunately too a lot of the jobs in when it comes to field work um, they don't pay very well because more people want to do them than there are jobs. And a bunch of people are starting to recognize this and realize that we really should be paying people for working. Uh, and so it's getting easier and easier to find paid jobs, uh, but there's still a lot of ones that um, not only won't pay you, but will ask you to pay them to help them on their project. And so uh, it can be really hard to, um, to kind of get ahead in this field. Um, and so I feel really lucky that, um, First of all, I managed to go to all sorts of crazy places and do fun things, but that it's actually worked out as a career. Um, and hopefully it'll keep working out as a career into the future. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the benefits we get from hibernating, unless it's just maybe extending life a little bit. Um, but it's sort of, it's something that people want to be able to do, maybe just to be able to do it. Uh, but there, there might be some other kind of side benefits. Oh, and sorry, the question was what benefits can humans get from hibernating? And, and yeah, not, not 100% sure. <laughs> but people want to be able to do it, so we can. <laughs> <coughs> Looks like the questions have slowed down, but there were some fantastic questions today. And I know I really enjoyed looking at your pictures of exceptionally cute mammals that I don't get to see around, you know, my backyard, like I see all the squirrels. So I want to thank you so much for coming out and spending an afternoon with us. It was really, really nice to see what kind of research you did along your pathway to Maine, but then also hear about some of the stuff that you're doing here in Maine as well. Um, do you hire students to work with you? I do. I usually end up hiring um, undergraduates at the university just because the paperwork's easier. <laughs> and um, one note, if anybody is going into university and you can get work study through the, the Pell Grants, it's 100% worth it because that means that some of the salary is paid for by the university and not by individual research projects. So um, this summer is a bit different because of social distancing. I think it's just going to be me and my graduate student working, but usually I hire one or two undergraduates. Uh, and they end up doing things like trapping and radio tracking and, um, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's great. And there's one more person who really wants to know what your favorite animal is. Yeah, it's hard. It's so hard. <laughs> I'm going to just keep seeing Tenrex because they're great. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So before we say goodbye, I'm just going to launch a last poll. And if you guys could tell us what you thought about today. Um, I added some questions because we are getting, um, you know, close to the end of the school year. The University of Maine had their uh, graduation last weekend. So I'd like to know as well, um, 
what you guys think about continuing these programs you know after may or after june so i have a couple extra questions this week for you so i'd appreciate your honest answers and i just want to thank dr levesque again for hanging out with us for this hour it was really great to hear about your research um, and see some of the really cool places that you were able to go Next week at this time, we have Dr. Erin McDonald. And Dr. McDonald, um, she's a new 4-H staff person in Southern Maine, but she's also an archeologist. And she's gonna share some of her research. And she's got some ideas for you on what you can learn from garbage. So I'm really excited to find out more about what you can learn from trash next week. Sounds so thanks for coming out spending a Tuesday afternoon with us. <laughs>